Hey, everybody. Good morning. Uh, good morning, all the new people. I don't know. I'm Anthony Fontana. I'm one of the fourth years. Um, so I'm going to talk about toxidromic EKGs. Um, basically, what I mean by that is similar to what you see when you see to uh, clinical toxidromes, where somebody comes in overdosed and um, they have a typical presentation that kind of leads you towards one diagnosis. There are some EKG findings that you'll see too, which when you see them, you should start thinking about a particular type of overdose as well. So I'm going to refer to those as toxidromic EKGs. Quick overview, so I'm going to talk about, um, I'm going to frame it kind of in uh, the setting of three different classes of cardiac toxins. There's the sodium channel blockers, which are classically the TCAs, uh, potassium efflux blockers, which are antiemetics, and the so sodium potassium ADPase blockers, um, the cardiac glycosides, which are usually digoxin, and then the treatments. So quick overview of cardiac action potential, and no, I'm kidding. So. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly thought this was going to be a lot more interesting of a topic when I first chose it, and it kind of ended up being a little bit boring, but I, I do think it's actually worth knowing. Um, so just bear with me a little bit. So a little bit of biochemistry, um, so uh, for the TCAs. So these are your sodium channel blockers. So um, can I, yeah, there we go. Um, so in your action potential, basically, you have rapid depolarization here, right? And that's what gives you your short and your narrow QRS complex. Um, and what happens with the sodium channel blockers, with the TCAs, is they're blocking that rapid depolarization. So having some of those channels blocked causes a lot more of a slow depolarization. When you look at your actual EKG, you're going to find that that short QRS is now a little bit wider. So that's why you get widening of your QRS. So what's going to give you the points on your tests? Because Honestly, I don't think I've ever seen anybody who's actually on a TCA come into the emergency room. So when you see the question come up on exams, this is what you're looking for. Um, so you're going to see widened QRS, right? Um, there are some things, okay, greater than 100 milliseconds, you have seizures. Greater than 160, you're at risk for ventricular dysrhythmias. Um, but the classic finding that you're looking for is something called right axis deviation of the QRS complex. Um, so we all know, we're all stuck over here. So basically the heart depolarizes from right to left, right? So you've got your AVR lead, which is on your right limb. So you should normally have a negative AVR um, depolarization because it's going across the heart. So when you have the QRS uh, deviated to the right, you're gonna have it going back up towards that right limb. So it's just a terminal part of the QRS. So you've got your normal looking down here, um, but then your R prime is gonna be a positive deflection. What do I mean by that? So normally this is your AVR lead here. This looks a lot more familiar to everybody. You see normally you've got no Q. You've got negative uh, Q, R, S negative here. Um, so here in your AVR, instead you're seeing a positive R prime. And that's going to be very pathognomonic for the TCA overdoses. And you also see that the QRS is widened here. There's definitions for it, whatever, greater than three millimeters or an R to S ratio, because we love ratios. Um, but this is what it's classically going to look like. And this is an actual EKG of a patient with a TCA overdose. Can we roll that one slide? Yeah. This one? Yes, just to correct that slide on the right, which is TCA toxicity. Yeah. And, and I will say, so the EKG does also kind of advance with exposure, too. So you can kind of see a degree of toxicity. Um, like here, you're saying this maybe is not as severe, but if you have a higher amount, then this is kind of what it can kind of deteriorate into, which is worsening.
and, and so why is bicarb the treatment for TC overdose? It's for two reasons. Um, it's one, because you want to give intravenous sodium, and two, because you also want to alkalize the serum as well. So sodium bicarbonate does both. Um, you could give uh, hypertonic saline as well, and that'll give you more um, sodium. And there's some recommendations that you should like aim towards uh, uh, serum sodium of 150. But basically, um, what's useful for us to know is you can do all the calculations, but we're basically going to be pushing two amps of sodium bicarbonate right away. And that's going to give you a pretty close approximation to um, what the, the dose is here. Um, if you need to, you can intubate your patient, um, one for airway protection, and two, because you're able to hyperventilate them. Um, you want to make sure that if you are pushing bicarb, you do hyperventilate because you need to blow off that excess hydrogen that you're forming. Um, you want to aim towards an alkalotic pH closer to 7.5. Um, and then, of course, any supportive treatment for any of the other side effects that you're seeing. Right. So in addition to sodium bicarb, you can give like hypertonic saline because you want to alkalize the serum, and that's what the bicarb is for, and you want to increase the serum sodium level, and that's sodium is for, basically. Yeah, like if you have no bicarb on hand at all, then you can give hypertonic saline. And you, right. Right. But you can also, intubating, you can get alkalotic as well. So, so a hypertonic saline and intubating can help achieve those two things as well. I don't know if sodium acetate, I'm sure, actually it's a good. The what? The sodium matters. Right. 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 More so. So those are sodium channel blockers, that's a TCA. So, yeah? Well, that's what Vince, I think, is saying here, is that you can, if you actually see this, oh, I'm going back the wrong way, then maybe not necessarily, but um, the degree shows worsening, right? Right. Back to where? Yeah. I mean, in this, I mean, it's a much worse EKG. It's almost looking like a hyperkalemia as well, where you're getting kind of a sinusoidal pattern as well. This is just the initial one, the, the classical finding you're going to see on EKGs. All right. So potassium efflux blockers, um, these are really, I'm talking about the antipsychotics and antiemetics. There's a lot of them. I think this is probably what we're more commonly going to see in the emergency room. Um, and so mechanistically here, if you have the action potential here as well, this is where potassium starts leaving the cell and you start getting repolarization. And that repolarization um, is shown by the T wave on your EKG. So if you're blocking potassium being able to leave your cell, then you're kind of um, slowing down that repolarization and you're shifting it further along in time. So you're getting your T wave moved further along on your rhythm strip. And that's why you have that um, prolongation of your QT interval, if that makes sense. Um, Prolonged QT is also a risk factor for tessade de point. Um, although it's not the degree of QT prolongation, it's just they're correlated with each other. So if you see it, you have to worry for tessade. Um, but you can't say a greater increase in your QT puts you at a greater risk of it. Um, I mean, I don't really have to, we know what QT prolongation looks like. This is our QT right here. This is what torsade looks like. It looks like a V-fib kind of around a rhythm where it's torsade and around a point. This is an EKG, obviously. You've got your T wave here, pressing very close to your P wave here. It's showing prolonged QT. And this is what torsad would look like on your 12 lead. So the treatment for this. Um, I think we all know magnesium sulfate is what you want to use if you have QT prolongation to suppress the dysrhythmia information. Um, it's not going to shorten your T wave. So unlike giving the sodium bicarb where you can get a repeat EKG um, and see improvement in your QRS, here giving magnesium sulfate will not shorten your QT interval. 
Um, more importantly, I think for us is if you have Tersod um, and it's not responding to your magnesium, if it's intermittent, somebody's kind of going in and out of it, you can try overdrive pacing them. Um, you have to be worried about doing something like a transvenous pacer because you can cause more uh, cardiac irritation that way as well. Um, and if it's sustained, then that's an indication to shock them. All right, last. Sodium potassium ATPase blockers, long word, basically just the cardiac glycosides, mostly digoxin. Um, so digoxin, really mechanistically, so here, this is your sodium potassium ATPase. Um, it's exchanging sodium out for potassium into the cell. If that's blocked, you don't have a lot of extracellular sodium, which is used in this sodium calcium exchanger to get calcium out of your cell. So indirectly, what's happening is you're increasing the amount of intracellular calcium within your cell. Um, by blocking this channel. Um, and that's kind of what we want it to do. That's why it's used a lot of times for CHF, and that's why it's used for AFib, um, because what it does is it can increase automaticity um, of the cardiac cells, and it can decrease conduction through the AV node. Um, that's also kind of what causes these um, toxic side effects as well. So that increased automaticity can lead to SVTs, um, and the decreased AV node conduction can lead to uh, AV block. So. This is a classic example of what you're going to see when you're looking for this. Sorry. Yeah. That's not that. I think you can get an SVT. You can. For sure, you can. You, can, you, you, get, you get Brady dysrhythmias, right? But the Brady dysrhythmias are because of the decreased conduction through the AV node. Um, you don't necessarily get the SVT, um, but you can get it in higher overdoses. It, it, digoxin can cause everything, basically. Right. Like everything. Right. So, right. So, by SVT, what I mean is you're seeing an increased atrial rate, but you're not seeing it conducted through, right? Yeah. So here, this is what that looks like on your 12 lead rhythm strip. So you've got your atrial rate around 150, um, but your actual ventricular rate is much, much slower because you've got the degree of a block there. And here, it's a second degree AV block. Um, and then because of that high degree AV block, you're seeing a lot of uh, ventricular escape beats. So you're going to see a lot of PVCs as well. So if you see this combination where you're seeing a fast atrial rhythm, a high degree of a block, and very frequent PVCs, that's very concerning for digoxin toxicity. And that's kind of a, a classical finding in that. Um, and the treatment is digibind at the end. I mean, so I clarify, by SVT, I don't mean conducted through the node. I'm sorry. I mean fast atrial rate. But there could be an accessory pathway where you can conduct and have SVT, right? I, see, I suppose so, yeah. So if that happens, does that mean they go to, like, they go, they, you can presume that they have, like, a WPW type thing? And what, they can't really treat them that way? What do you mean? Like if you see if you see a fastly conducted atrial rate in somebody on digoxin, do you have to worry that there's an accessory pathway? No. I don't know the answer to that. but I can get back to you in a week. <laughs> um, lastly, I just want to talk about the digoxin effect because um, this is not a sign of toxicity. Um, and I think it's something that is thrown around a lot where people talk about the Salvador Dali mustache and everybody thinks, oh my god, it's digoxin toxicity. Um, and it's not. So this is seen in therapeutic digoxin use. Um, so basically, just being on digoxin can cause this downsloping of the uh, ST interval right here. And it also can cause a lot of changes in your T wave, which can be flattened, it can be inverted, or biphasic. So that swooping and that flattening here is supposed to resemble Salvador Dali's mustache. Um, so without knowing anything about a patient at all, if you see this EKG come in, you can say, OK, I'm looking at it here. I don't see any P waves at all. I'm looking at the rate, and it looks like a very irregular rate. And then I'm looking at my ST intervals, and it kind of looks a little bit like Salvador Dali's mustache. This person must be on digoxin. Um, make you seem kind of cool. Um, but you can't say anything about whether they're on a toxic dose or not. Um, so this is a quick summary. So the TCAs can cause a widened QRS. Uh, you get right axis deviation just of that last part of the QRS complex, which you're looking at AVR because that's your right limb lead. Uh, Antipsychotics, antimedics can cause prolonged QT into side the point. And the cardiac glycosides can cause everything. Yes?
Do you know? I'd have to listen to the lecture. I don't, so wait, say it, say it again. So using isoproteranol for prolonged QT. To increase your rate so that you can avoid overdrive. Right. I see, I, see, I, see, I see what you're saying, right? So it's basically you're doing a medical overdrive pacing as opposed to doing electric, right? right? Does, does that work when you overdose on a medication that would have a lot of I don't know. I don't know. I mean, the, the, worry, the worry with um, torsades with when you have this prolonged QT from this overdrive, um, from the medication overdose, is that what happens is since you're blocking the potassium out after you've depolarized, you're not giving the cell enough time to repolarize and if it triggers back into an early depolarization again, that can get you into like these ventricular rhythms which can cause torsade. So that's how mechanistically you get torsade from it. I don't know if by giving a medication which is gonna allow you to overdrive that, if you can prevent that, I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Sweet.